our message this morning is called How to Get and Remain Undeceived. I must be doing it again. I'm not sure what I did last week, but screen mirroring. Let's see. Uh, this might work. We'll see if this works. All right, it's working. Awesome. Well, let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for the opportunity to study your word and to study history. And I pray right now that as we do, that Jesus would be uplifted and that you would challenge us onto a higher sphere of a relationship with you and a greater blessing to the world around us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, we're going to talk, we're talking about how to get and remain undeceived, and so we're going to talk about the, the actual definition of the word deceit to begin with. In the dictionary, it comes from leading of another person to believe what is false. Actually, it literally means a catching or an ensnaring, trapping somebody, right? Nobody wants to be trapped. You know, I've read about the missionaries or pastors who've been trapped in boxes for weeks or months at a time. Nobody wants to be trapped. That's a nightmare. And so deceit is literally a catching or an ensnaring and leading of another person to believe what is false or not to believe what is true and thus to ensnare him. This is from the 1828 dictionary, the original Noah Webster's Dictionary. It's a phenomenal dictionary if you're ever doing Bible study uh, to at least help you understand the English language anyway. And there's really probably three categories of deception. There may be other sub-factors to this, but number one is intentional deception where someone knows that they're lying to you and they're seeking to lead you in a false direction. That does happen from time to time. There's some very evil people out there, but I don't think that's the majority of the cases. Another case is unintentional deception, where somebody believes themselves what is false, and so they propagate what they formerly heard themselves. So that's unintentional deception. The third of them is self-deception, where you choose to believe something that is wrong, in part because we all like to have a logically coherent perspective, and so we sometimes, we, we do things that are wrong, and so we try to rationalize why we do what we do. We're going to come back to un this self-deception in just a moment. But if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24, the first gospel. Matthew chapter 24, and we're going to begin in verse 5. We looked at these few passages in our meetings. Matthew chapter 24. And what do we see? Matthew chapter 24. We're going to begin in verse 5. It says here. We'll actually start in verse 4. It says, And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man, what? Deceives you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall, what? Deceive many. So Jesus says here twice, take heed, beware that no one deceives you, no one tricks you, no one leads you astray. He says it twice, right, in two verses. Jump down to verse 11. In verse 11, he says, and many false prophets shall rise and shall, what? and shall deceive many. And jump down to verse 24. And in verse 24, we read, it says here, For there shall rise false Christs and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the elect. So we see this time and time again here. We see repeatedly that What's happening is that Jesus is warning us, be careful that you are not deceived. Be careful that you are not deceived. Be careful that you are not deceived. Sorry, I'm having a little trouble here with the computer. Uh, let's see here. Let me try it again. No? Sorry. I think we may just go without it, um, which is all right. So what, do we see is, what we see is that Jesus is warning us not to be deceived at the end. And if he shares this with us four times in one passage, you can know that this is a very serious issue at the end of time, that we should be careful that we are not deceived. And thinking of this, Paul tells us, Paul warns us, 
in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 14 and 15, he says, and no marvel, that means don't be surprised, and no mar- marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light, therefore it is of no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness whose end shall be according to their works. So Paul also tells us to be careful because something is going to happen. Satan can be transformed into an angel of light. He can come looking as if he is beautiful, as if he is holy. He could be even espousing or preaching some of the same messages that Jesus shares. And as he does so, many people would think, well, this must be of God. This must be him. This must be the truth of the word of God. And believing that, they could be led astray. They could be led astray. And so we need to know, what does the Bible actually teach? What is the truth of the word of God? And in order to do that, we need to actually spend... Thank you, brother. You are, uh, you are much appreciated. Thank you so much for doing that. Now, if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Revelation chapter 16. This is a warning of what's going to be coming upon the earth at the end of time. Revelation chapter 16. Revelation, the 16th chapter. And remember, we already discovered in Revelation, Revelation tells us, it says in verse 3, Revelation 1 verse 3, Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein. Revelation was given in part to make God's people happy. Many times people are afraid of it. It's because they are not reading it, understanding it, and walking in it, because it was actually meant not to make us afraid, but to make us happy. And so Revelation chapter 16 says in verse 12, it says, And the sixth angel poured out his vial, this is the sixth plague, upon the great river Euphrates, And the water thereof was dried up, that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, and out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. And it says, for they are the spirits of devils working what? Miracles, which go forth unto the kings of the earth, and of the whole world to gather them unto the battle of the great day of God Almighty. So what do we see here? We see that there's going to be miracles at the end of time. These miracles, Revelation chapter 13 tells us, are going to deceive many. Because today, people, we're we're just so used to a secular society, right? We're so used to seeing things that are just, they kind of go on and skepticism is on the rise. We see that Europe is way ahead of the United States when it comes to atheism, agnosticism. I've had the opportunity to live in two different countries in Europe and the level of atheism is off the charts. Almost everybody that we would run into would not believe in God. And imagine if miracles began to take place on planet Earth, do you think there would be a lot of atheists if there were miracles that were just manifesting themselves around the planet? No, there would be very few atheists. The trouble is, the Bible warns us that many of these miracles will be taking place not from God, but from the enemy, right? And so you could see how people could be converted very rapidly to false teaching as a result of this, and this says that's what's going to happen. There's going to be these great miracles. Look in Revelation chapter 19. Hang it right. Revelation chapter 19 and verse 20, and it says, And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet, that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast, and them that worshipped his image, these both were cast alive into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone. So notice once again we get this picture of miracles deceiving people into receiving the mark of the beast at the end of time. And so how can we avoid being deceived? 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 is one of the clearest messages on this issue. Speaking once again of the Antichrist power, it says even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish. Why are people perishing? Because they receive not the, what? Love of the truth that they might be saved. So it's not that they never heard the truth at the end of time because the message of the gospel, the three angels' messages are going to go to every nation 
kindred, tongue, and people. Every, everyone on, on the planet is going to have the opportunity to hear the truth. People will not be lost because they didn't have an opportunity to hear the truth. They're going to be lost because they didn't have a, what? A love for the truth that they might be saved. All can be saved. God wants everyone to be saved. But in order to be saved, we have to have that love for the truth. Now, what is the foundation of truth itself? Jesus said to him in John 14, verse 6, I am the way, the what? The truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus says that he is the truth, right? Now, the Bible is the manifestation of the truth, but that truth is encapsulated in God. And Jesus, as he came to earth as a man, he was the living truth. He was also called the Word of God, right? And so, do we have an actual love for the truth? Now, it's probably less, somewhere around 20% of Christians spend time daily with Jesus and his word. Probably somewhere around 20%. And I've shared this before, but do people typically find it hard to spend time doing things they love? No. Some guy loves football, what does he do? He talks about it, and he makes sure the game is on, right? Right? That's not something that interests me. I mean, I even played football when I was young, but I, I've, I don't have any, I, it's not something I, I want to be a part of. But the, but the point in saying this is what? Is that if we have, if we have an interest in something, we find time to do it. Very few young people would say, man, I just struggle. I, you know, I love TikTok, but I just can't find time to get on there, right? That's just not a common saying. Because if they love it, they find a way to be on TikTok, Right? Or somebody else, you know, the older folks might love to be on Facebook or whatever or watching the news or being on the internet or watching movies or whatever it is. When we love something, we do not find it very hard to make time for it, right? And do we have a love? Remember, it tells us that people are going to be lost not because they didn't have the truth or they didn't hear the truth or they didn't ever go to a church that was preaching the truth, but it's that they didn't have a love for the truth that they might be saved. And once again, I didn't used to have a love for the truth. I didn't. wasn't even interested in it. I didn't care. Actually, I wasn't wanting to read the Bible. And then uh, my friend Andy, he was an atheist. He and I were at the mall. We met some girls. He got a girl's phone number, and she invited him to church. And what does every good atheist do when he gets invited to church? Guys, what do they do? They go, right? Why? Because they want to get the girl. And so he did. Now, this is kind of a terrible illustration because most of the time they do it just to get the girl and then, you know, they aren't very spiritual after they get married. That's normal. But Andy, on the other hand, he actually did give his life to Jesus. And the reason that I know he did it is because he broke it off with the girl afterward. But long story short, I told you some of this story, but Andy and I were, were later on, Uh, he actually was the person who invited me to a Bible prophecy seminar. He wasn't a part of this faith, but he got invited by somebody, and he's the reason I went to the Bible prophecy seminar, and this was while I was in college. And so what ended up happening is Andy and I, you know, we were very close friends, and Scott Ritzema was our other friend. The three of us, we grew up together, not in this faith, but uh, something happened. I had, Andy and I were at a coffee shop. I used to drink tons of coffee since I was a little kid, and Um, Now, I know better, you know, that it drops the blood flow to the brain by roughly 40% and so forth, but that's a side note. But nevertheless, I quit that, and uh, this atheist, we were actually witnessing to an atheist. We were not in this faith, but we had given our lives to the Lord, and we had given our lives to Jesus, and we met this atheist, and we were trying to witness to him, and this atheist looked at me, and he said, so you're a Christian? I said, yes. He said, Okay, he said, uh, tell me the Ten Commandments. I had no idea what the Ten Commandments were. He said, you're a Christian, you don't even know what the Ten Commandments are? And I realized I look like a fool. So he wasn't done with me, though. He said, so you're a Christian? 
I said yes. He said, do you believe in the Bible? And I'm already, you know, not really happy that he's continuing this line of questioning. It's not going well for me, right? He said, so you're a Christian? I said, yes. He said, do you believe in the Bible? I said, yes. He said, have you ever read it? And I had never read it. And he said, how can you believe a book you've never read? And I look like an absolute fool, and I knew it. And so what Christians do when they have no good answer is they use like these church school answers like, I believe it based on faith. These ridiculous answers. And that's ridiculous because the Bible says, so then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the what? Word of God. So if you haven't read the Word of God, you're believing it by blind faith, not by true faith. Do you follow? We need to actually be in the Word of God ourselves. And so I'll tell you what, I look like an absolute fool, and I'm so glad that I did, because it was because of this, this young atheist that I decided I'm going to go home, and I'm going to read the Bible through so that nobody can ever ask me that again, and I will look like a fool. So I read the Bible purely out of selfishness the first time purely out of selfish motive, and you know what? I'm so glad I did because it changed my life while I was reading it. You may go into the Bible the first time with absolute selfishness. I, would, I, I was in college. Every day I had to study like five hours because some professors have no idea that their class is not the most important class in the world. They think you need like 50 pages of reading a night. So I'm reading and reading and reading and reading and studying. And, and what I would do is I would take a break in my five hours of study every day. I love study any, anyway. I like reading. But So I, I would take a break and I would chew tobacco and I would read the Bible every day. Every day I would do that. And you know what? If you struggle with addiction, like smoking or drinking, I heard of a, a, a lady, I was just at another church in this this pastor said this woman was coming, she was smoking, she was struggling, and the pastor said to her, listen, okay, you can smoke, but I want to challenge you to only smoke while you're reading the Bible. And some of you might think, I think that's heresy. But guess what? It worked, because she didn't smoke much longer. And I was chewing, and I was chewing, and I was chewing, and later on, I found out that the Bible says, what? Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God, and you are not your own, for you are bought with a price? Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. And when you discover that, guess what? You realize, I can't keep destroying my body. I can't keep doing that. And Jesus tells us that he wants to give us the victory. And so it is through the process of studying, searching through the Word of God, that you begin to have a love for the Word of God and the one who is at the center of the Word, who gave us the Word, and that is Jesus. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by Him. But perhaps the most dangerous, the most dangerous kind of deception is self-deception. I see this, you know, sometimes on a regular basis, especially when you do meetings, you can see rationalizations where, where we fight the truth, not because we don't see it, but because we're trying to keep our old former life and yet rationalize why we're actually wanting to do it. But the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18, it says, let no one deceive what? himself, because the Bible recognizes that we are prone to self-deception. Let no one deceive himself. If anyone among you thinks he is wise in this age, let him become a fool that he may become wise. And I'm so glad that this young man made me look like an absolute fool because it made me realize how foolish I was. And then we can seek to find the wisdom of God. And you know, the Bible talks about our own heart. And I know we live in a Disney world and, and people raise their children watching Disney, you know, these, these movies that are teaching them the wonderful truths of spiritualism and so forth. And the uh, selfishness of the human heart, the follow your heart. Is that a safe guide for us, yes or no? The Bible says back in Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 9, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can what? Know it. The heart. Follow your heart. Do not follow your heart is what the Bible says. Follow Jesus Christ and allow him to change your heart. Transform your heart, which by the way is what the new covenant is about. 
where the Holy Spirit begins to write the law in your mind and in your heart, right? And so we need to be changed and transformed. The Bible says in John chapter 17, verse 17, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Sanctify them through thy word. Or sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Now, the Bible also warns us about something that is often taught I, while I was in school, I think of uh, the philosophy class that I was taking. Reading my Bible, you know, part of the day, and I'm also reading, you know, these philosophers. And the Bible says in Colossians chapter 2, verse 8, Beware, watch out, lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. Philosophy is a funny thing because I remember... While in, while in college, I'm, I'm reading Descartes in philosophy course. I'm reading Descartes on first philosophy. You may remember that book. It's a fascinating book, and Descartes is the one who basically gave us the concept, I think, therefore, I am. And he wrote an entire book to try to help us to understand. And, and so I'm reading this book, and it has these illustrations and things that you would maybe try to grasp. And the basic conclusion of this book on philosophy, kind of one of the foundational aspects of philosophy, Descartes basically comes to the conclusion, I am here. I really, really, really am here. And you sit there and you read that book and you're like, wow. I am here. Yeah, I'm here. And then later on I thought about it and I thought, if you asked a four-year-old, where are you? What would they tell you? I'm right here. But it can take a philosopher a hundred pages to come to that conclusion, right? And we think it's so deep and wise and it's filled with wisdom. I think philosophy is the great act of making people think that they are thinking. That's what it does. It basically makes people think that they are thinking when in reality they already know the answer, right? They don't need some book and some philosopher to tell them that, right? But strangely enough, these things can lead people astray from the Word of God, but it says... They can lead us away. We can be led by the tradition of men after the rudiments of the world, but not after Christ. But then we also see in verse 10, it says the beautiful passage, it says, you are complete in him. If you're looking for completeness, you are complete in him. You know, I, I just, saw, just saw a clip of this, this guy. He, he has a country living channel on, on the internet. And uh, probably has, I'm guessing, over a million followers or whatever. And, and he said, just this week, he put out a video and he said, I am not happy. He said, I have everything I've ever wanted. I own a house out in the country. I'm making videos that are being seen around the world. I have a beautiful girlfriend who, who loves me and supports me. And he said, I am not happy. And I mentioned before that Tom Brady, the most successful quarterback in history, same thing. The most successful quarterback in history with a supermodel wife said, I am not happy. I, I, there's, and, then, and then they asked him, well, what is it? What, what else is there? What are you looking for? And he says, I wish I knew. I wish I knew. The Bible says in Colossians 2 verse 10, you are complete in him. You are complete in Jesus. You will never find it, ever. Somewhere else, not in riches, not in a fancy home, nice car, a beautiful husband or wife, whatever. You never found it. These things, like having a husband or a wife or friendship or these kind of things, or, or a home or a car, they can be blessings to us, but they will never create happiness in us. You are complete in Him. So, how do we know what the truth is? Well, we know it's in Jesus. We know it's in the Word. And the Bible says in Isaiah chapter 8, verse 20, to the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this Word, it is because there is no what? There is no light in them. So if, if somebody comes along proclaiming to follow the truth, they need to be according to the law and the testimony. Now, the law could be not only the Ten Commandments, but it could be the first five books of the Bible. And by the way, many people get further and further away from the first five books of the Bible, don't they? 
Oh, I was just watching, uh, uh, you know, the Pope himself say, oh, the, you know, the, the story of Genesis is just a myth, right? The Bible says to the law and to the testimony, do we actually believe what God said in his word, or do we think we've gone beyond that? When we get to heaven, we're going to see we were so, we had, we had degraded from the truth rather than we were becoming wiser. I assure you we're going to discover that when we get into heaven, the new earth. To the law and to the testimony, the testimony of the prophets, the law and the prophets, the, the messages of scripture, the Bible. To the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. So what do we need to do? What are some of the things we need to do not to be deceived? You know this verse, 2 Timothy 2.15, study to show thyself approved unto God, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly what? Dividing the word of truth. We need to be studying, we need to be spending time in God's word, or we are going to be led astray. This is something we need to do daily, spending time with our Savior, not letting a day go by because we all have time for the things in life that we love. You know the story probably of William Tyndale, this man. He translated the Bible into the English language. It was in October of 1536. William Tyndale was burnt at the stake for his translation of the English Bible. And some of his last words before he passed away were, Oh God, open the eyes of the King of England. Notice he didn't die with cursings on his lips. He was praying that this man would have his eyes opened to the truth, to the word of God. And God wants to give us that same heart of William Tyndale, that love for our persecutors. This is something that no human can concoct. And you remember Martin Luther. Martin Luther was persecuted. He would have been killed, but his life was spared because some of the, the understanding and, and uh, far-seeing men, these prescient men, realized they're going to capture him, they're going to kill him, so we're going to capture him and stick him in a castle to save his life rather than allow him to lose his life, Right? And I've had a couple opportunities to be in that castle to see where Martin Luther translated the New Testament. But Martin Luther, while he was at the point where he was put on the stand at the Diet of Worms, at the Council of Worms, I've had the opportunity to stand at the spot where Martin Luther was, where he was put before the judge and asked, will he recant? Would he let go of his faith in, of the truth of the Word of God and of the teachings that he had been espousing, in righteous, uh, espousing rather, by righteousness by faith? And this was his response. He said, unless I shall be convinced by the testimonies of the Scriptures, or by clear reason, I neither can nor will make any retraction, since it is neither safe nor honorable to act against conscience, God help me. He said, I, I can't turn back. Imagine being put on the stand for your life and saying, will you let go of some of the things that you believe right now? You can go along with the rest of society. You can still be a Christian. You can even still believe in the Bible. But you, you, know, you just got to let go of just a few things that you believe. Would you be willing to give your life? And remember, we talked about this last week. You don't need the faith of a martyr until you actually come to the point where you are called to be a martyr. But to get to that point, we need to be clinging to Jesus daily. We need to be spending time with our Lord and Savior every single day. Now let's talk about that word convinced for a moment. Because we're convinced by the truth. Sometimes we're convicted on our own conscience. These, these words could be synonyms, conviction, convinced, right? Now I want to talk about a few quick signs of conviction. How do we know when we're being convicted, when the Holy Spirit is speaking to our mind and our hearts? Well, one of the first examples is, let's say you're hearing the Word of God, maybe you've been living in sin, maybe you've been living in addiction, and then you hear about the love of Jesus, and that He wants to set you free, and you've lived such a terrible life. A friend of mine, his dad was a drug dealer, and a cocaine dealer specifically, and this man had lived a life of absolute and utter sin. He came to a Bible prophecy seminar. When he was there, you know, he broke down crying because he just thought, God could never forgive me. He could never forgive me for the things that I have done. And so 
the minister talked with him and he told him, no, Jesus died for your sins already. He already took those sins to the cross. He loves you with an everlasting love. His life was changed and he became himself a Christian. And friends, we can have that joy where we, we, we come to the Lord. That is one of the signs of conviction, that the Holy Spirit has touched our heart. We begin to have joy in our heart. That's a positive sign of conviction. Another one, number two, is a desire to share. You hear the truth and you want to go tell somebody about it. When I first heard about these wonderful messages, I began to go around and tell people about it. I went to my mom. I remember seeing people, you know, someone at school, and I went up to them and told them about it. I had a desire to share. It was, it was evidence that the Holy Spirit was working on my heart. Number three, when people are convicted by Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit, another one is they begin to have positive lifestyle changes. Maybe where once they were, you know, uh, living in sin now, they say, oh man, I used to live that way, but I, I need to make right some of the wrongs of my past. Man, I had, to, I had to do all kinds of that, trying to make right things from my past. And so calling people up, apologize. I spent thousands of dollars to right some of the wrongs of my past. And so these are some of the signs that the Holy Spirit is working on your heart. Now these we might call the positive indicators of the conviction of the Holy Spirit. We're going to now talk about some of them that don't feel so positive, but they can have positive results in your life. Number four is that you could be pricked at the heart. Well, what do I mean by that? Actually, that comes from the Bible. In Acts chapter 2, it was the day of Pentecost. And Peter is preaching the gospel, and, and he says to the people, this Jesus, who had just been there, this Jesus whom you crucified is both Lord and Christ. And so he's preaching this, and they heard this in Acts chapter 2, verse 36 to 38, say, Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart. Does that sound like it would feel good? Somebody poked you in the heart? No, that doesn't sound very like a good feeling. And said, and Sorry, now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost or of the Holy Spirit. So what was he told? They, they were, or what were they told? They, were, they felt pricked. They felt convicted. We have sinned. What do we do? And he said, Repent and be baptized. Even if you feel bad for what you've done, God still loves you and he wants you to turn from it because he wants you to have the joy of the Lord, the peace of the Lord. So we see you can also feel pricked, which doesn't sound good, but it can have good results if you yield to the conviction of the Spirit. Number five, sometimes people after sinning, they feel sorrow in the presence of the Lord. They feel bad. One example is this sad picture right above us, right? It's kind of, I always feel sad looking up at that picture, don't you? I mean, Jesus looks wonderful, but this poor guy, it's like every, every week, you know, like, poor guy, he's turning away from the Lord, you know? And um, you wish he wouldn't have. And same time, every time I read the story of Pilate, I'm just like, make the right decision, make the right decision. I mean, I know where he's going already, but like, eh, you know, he's being convicted, but he chooses to turn away from it, right? And, the rich young ruler, same thing. He went away sorrowful because he had great what? He had great riches, so he was sorrowful. Now, he could have had sorrow and said, what? Now, he would have had the greatest riches that had ever been had he actually come and become a disciple, like it almost sounds like Jesus was asking him to become. He would have had the greatest joy in, in, in the universe, right? I'm outside of God himself, but he could have had such joy and such riches, but his fear was, I may have to let go of the riches here. But if he would have, that conviction could have changed his life. Number six, avoidance. Avoidance. Sometimes, I'll tell you, give, give you a personal experience. I knew, I knew that the book of James said that you are to confess your faults one to another. Meaning, if, if you hurt somebody, you should go and apologize to them, right? And I, had, I, had, I knew the Holy Spirit was convicting me to go apologize to a minister, actually. And... Um, I was fighting the conviction. I was fighting the conviction. And so, you know what? I didn't want to read the book of James. 
because I knew it would tell me that I am a sinner and that I need to make it right. So I was like avoiding the book of James. Sometimes we avoid, sometimes it could be we avoid a preacher or we avoid a person or we avoid somebody because we know that they, they kind of convict us of our sins. Or in this case, it could be, well, maybe wanting to avoid, could you imagine wanting to avoid some prophet because they make you feel convicted? Wow. I've been there. I'll, I'll tell you, praise the Lord, I went and apologized to that brother, and now I could stand before the Word of God without shame and remorse. I've washed his feet, you know, I think. It's been years ago, but I, it was, I think it was at the time of foot washing. I think I did, but nevertheless, I at least apologized. I can remember that for sure. My life is a bit of a vague memory. But nevertheless, I did apologize to him, that I know. And I say this saying that we don't have to walk with shame and remorse in front of the Word of God. We can, we can know that our sins are forgiven. We can know that. We can yield our hearts so we don't have to go on with the avoidance. Number seven is a sense of guilt. You may feel ashamed for your sins, but as we've said, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Another sign sometimes of conviction is anger and rebellion. One of the examples of that is Stephen back in Acts chapter 7. Stephen was preaching to the leadership of Israel and he was preaching to them about, once again, Jesus. That he had died, he had been crucified, and you've rejected him just like our fathers rejected all the prophets. And so he says this, and what happened? It says, and when they heard these things, the religious leaders, they were cut to the heart. That didn't feel good. And they gnashed on him with their teeth. I'm guessing that means like, you know, they were just angry. But, He being full of the Holy Ghost, he was filled with the Holy Spirit. He looked steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God and said, Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. That anger could have, they could have said, you know, I'm rebelling, but I want to yield my life. I was rebelling by not doing what God was calling me to do. Go and apologize to this brother. I was rebelling. But even if you've been in that rebellion, you can say, you know what, I'm done with it. I'm sick of rebelling. I'll never find peace in rebellion. I'll never find peace. If I yield my heart, I can find the joy of the Lord. And God is saying to you, you too can find the peace of sins forgiven. You too can sense that in your own soul. And the last one of these nine things is, number nine, is feeling like the message was just for you. I was preaching a meeting in uh, Central California, and there was a um, young man coming, probably in his mid to upper 20s. He was a gang member in a gang called the Bulldogs, and this brother was a rough and tumble brother, but, but he was also someone who had one of the softest hearts I've ever seen. I mean, he was a tough guy from a tough background, from a tough gang. He lifted up his shirt. We were studying the Bible with him one, one day, and he lifted up his shirt, and he said, my stepdad stabbed my brother-in-law to death and he stabbed me and you could still see the, the wound, not the wound, the scar in his stomach. And we were studying at that moment. The reason he showed us is because we were studying the fact that Jesus said that if you want your sins to be forgiven, you have to forgive your enemies or those who've trespassed against you. And so he lifted up his shirt, told us a story, and he said, is God calling me? Is God calling me to forgive him? And I'll tell you what. All of us in the room, including myself, we started crying because we understood. This was not just a little, somebody was a little rude to me at church. This was somebody murdered my brother and stabbed me. Are you telling me I have to forgive? And sometimes people leave church because of little quibbles and little problems. Lord, help us. Don't give up on Jesus because somebody's a little mean to you. Hold on to Jesus. Don't lose out on eternal life because somebody was a little rude to you. Friends, it's going to get a lot worse. I don't say that with joy. I have had people be absolutely rude to me. Even I think of one minister in the church, and you know what? I don't even know his name, and I don't even care. I hope the best for him, and I hold nothing against him. Things that have been done. And I, I, we can't leave, friends. We can't leave because somebody does something to us. 
We need to continue looking at Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, keeping our eyes on him. And this, why did I bring that young man up? Here it is. Feeling like the message was for you. I was preaching the message, and I was preaching, and, and he, I even looked at him every once in a while while I was preaching, and he, he looked like this. He, I'm not kidding. He was like, he was looking like this while I was preaching. And, and afterward, he told me, he's like, I knew it. I knew I knew this sermon was just for me, and I knew the whole room was looking right at me. And I was not preaching that. I wasn't even thinking about him, other than the fact that I saw this guy like looking so rough in the crowd. I wasn't, I wasn't even thinking that. This was not like a jab at him, not at all. But you know what? The Holy Spirit was saying to him, give up your old life. Give your life to Jesus Christ. I can wash your sins away. And one day we came to his house and he, he pulled out, because we had given him a, a steps to Christ, and he, he pulled it out and he had underlined things. He's like, look at that. Look at what it says. Look at the beautiful things. God can change all of us. It doesn't matter what our background is. He can set us free. Romans chapter 2 verse 4 says, Or do you despise the riches of his goodness, forbearance and patience, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to what? Repentance. It is the goodness of God. When we feel convicted like we're called to give something up, maybe you have some sin. Maybe you need to even take like a break from TikTok. Maybe you need to take a break from the internet or from the news, or whatever it is, you need to take a break, a fast from these things, so that you have time with the Lord, right? Do you not know that it is the goodness of God that leads you to repentance? Sometimes we have to lay our idols down so that we can find the one true God. Maybe we have to come to Jesus, maybe even struggling with an addiction to pornography, and Jesus is saying, I can set you free. That is the number one addiction in North America today, to pornography. The statistics are mind-blowing. Like the vast majority of men, and even probably close to a majority of women. These are the times that we're living in. We are living in times where, yeah, some things we don't like to talk about, but everybody knows about it. And Jesus is saying, I can set you free, that you don't have to stand ashamed. Listen, YouTube knows every not YouTube, Google knows everything you've been looking at. And they know everything. It's all recorded forever, right? They know these things. And they can also say, oh, he stopped watching, right? <laughs> now they're not watching because they don't care about you. You mean nothing to them, probably. But they got all the data for your history, right? <laughs> they know everything we've ever looked at. And the good news is, so does God. But God is saying, you know what? I can set you free from that. I can set you free from the addictions, the things that have been holding you down. I can set you free. God is so good, and it is his goodness, meaning that we look to Jesus on the cross as we behold him on the cross, as we behold what our sin has done to him, and we see his goodness, his patience, his long-suffering with us, as we behold that, his goodness leads us to repentance, to turn away from the sins that have crucified the Son of God. We see his love. We see his condescension. We see his sacrifice for us. And as we look at Jesus recognizing this, it causes us to repent of our sins. And the Bible says in Acts chapter 5 and verse 32, yeah, before, before you read it, you, you think there are people out there, you know, they'll be, they'll be like smoking a joint or drinking a beer and they'll say, oh, I got the Holy Spirit, I got the Holy Ghost. But what does the Bible actually say? The Bible says in Acts chapter 5, verse 32, and we are his witnesses of these things, and so is also the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit, whom God hath given to them that what? Obey him. If we want more of the Spirit, we need to obey. Now, we don't get to go to heaven because we obey. No. But if you want more of the Holy Spirit, the Bible says it. That is, the Holy Spirit speaks to you, convicting you of sin, yield to the Spirit, and you'll be given more of the Spirit. And as you continue to yield you more, he'll give you more of the Spirit. And in the last days, many times people, they love, there, there's a few quotes that people love to focus on, like what's going to be worse in the end than you can even imagine. Many times you can, you can suppose what's going to happen in the end, but it's going to be way worse this time, and we say, have a good day. You know, it's like, wow, really? That's kind of scary. But we're also told that in the greatest time of difficulty, 
in the greatest time of extremity, God's going to come forth with even greater power through His Holy Spirit. So yes, it's going to be difficult, but God is going to come through with greater power for His people because He loves you. And He will not leave you fatherless. He will be with you in the trials day by day if you give your heart to Him. We do know, sadly, Matthew chapter 10, verse 36 to 8, a man's foes shall be they of his own household. It's going to be a trial at the end of time. He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he that taketh not his cross and followeth, not after, or followeth after me is not worthy of me. I remember when I was deciding whether I would go forward and what God was calling me to do, I thought, but what would my family think? I was, it was in a battle. And I was like, I can't do it. I can't go forward. And then I thought, this verse came to my mind. If you love your father, your mother, your sister, your brother more than me, you're not worthy of me. And I thought, no, no, I, I can't do this, but, but, but I, I still want to be a Christian. I was trying to self-deceive. I was trying to, trying to rationalize why I didn't have to do what I saw, the, that what, I, what I was convicted to do, as we talked about. And so then I would try to rationalize, but then that verse would come to me, if you love your father, your brother, your sister, your mother more than me, you're not worthy of me. And then I would rationalize, rationalize, if you love your father, your mother, your sister, your brother more than me, you're not worthy of me. And I wrestled through the night. It was, it was horrendous. But finally, this battle was, it was horrible. It was one of the worst nights of my life. Finally, I just said, okay, God, I'll go forward in what you're asking me to do. And peace came over my soul. And it was, I'll be honest with you, it was the best decision I've ever made in my life. No glory to me. I look back and I can't even believe that God gave me the strength to do it. I can take zero credit because I had no strength. But Jesus gave me the strength to walk forward. Friends, we need to avoid the self-deception, which is one of the greatest dangers. And I want to close by talking about some people who lived in a very dark time which kind of symbolizes what God's people are going to go through. It was, it was the Waldensies. Some of you have probably been to this very building here. It's in Italy, northern Italy, in, in the Alps. This is what's called the School of the Barbs. Anybody ever been in this building right here, the School of the Barbs? Anybody? My wife and I, but unless I'm seeing, it looks like just the two of us. But this is where the Waldensies, this was the school for the Waldensies. Inside that school, you had one central table with the Word of God. And in that book, this is the old, the old language of the Waldensi people. And the Waldensis were a powerful people, not in the sense of number or true human power, but had power in the Word of God. These were a people during the reign of papal supremacy. These people had the Bible in their own language. They had to flee to the mountains. They had to live in the mountains. They were actually forced. They were not allowed to live be below a certain elevation. There was a certain elevation they had to live above for a time period. So they were forced up there. We've been up in there. I've walked through the Valley of the Inconquerables where they were almost annihilated, but God spared their lives. Hiked through them with some, some Waldensi children who took us up there because we were, we were recording a documentary. But these people, I love these people. Maybe you've heard the story of this young Waldensi she was a young girl at the time, and she, was, she went to an execution of one of her friends who had been caught with a Bible. She went to the execution, and as the fires, as they had put the sticks all around her, she was put on the stake, and the fires began to go up. She didn't actually want to watch her friend lose her life, and so she saw that happen. Somehow, some way, the thought came to her mind, I will never marry a man who does not love God as much as I do. That was her thought. Why, why it was at that moment, I think it was the Holy Spirit. And so she did at some point find a faithful Waldensi young man who loved Jesus every bit as much as her, and they were married. Later on, they had children. And at this point in the story, the, her daughter was about 12 years old, and this family actually had a Bible. They had a Bible. 
And she, what she would do is her goal, because many Waldenses would memorize and memorize and memorize, because the Catholic Church would often send soldiers into there to search out Bibles, and they would execute people, and they would take their Bibles. They would confiscate them. And so what she would do, what they would all do, is memorize large chunks of the Bible. And so she actually wanted to memorize the entire Bible. And so she would have it sitting out, and while she was making bread, she would go over to it, look at the verses for a moment to get them in her head, and she would knead the bread and work on the dough, and then she would go back to make sure she had the wording right. And she would do this day in, day out, day in, day out in her work. She was storing up the Word of God in her mind and in her heart. And one particular day, she heard outside, and she could hear horses run up to the house, and within almost no time, the door burst open to the house. Some of you have heard this story. And there she was, the soldiers from the Church of Rome had at least been sent from the Church of Rome, and there they were, they were in, and they, and they said, there's word here that there's a Bible in this home. And the daughter was there, and she, the Bible had been behind the daughter, a little off to the side, the mother was behind her, and when the daughter saw this, she absolutely froze. Many times people freeze in times of fear. And so she frees, she doesn't even move because she's thinking, they're going to see it, it's right there behind us, but she can't see it because she's standing with her back to it. She's thinking they're going to see it. And the mother said to her, just to the soldiers very calmly, you're welcome to search the whole house. And the daughter's thinking, it's right there, what are you, what are you talking about? But she's just frozen. The mother just went and took the bread she was making and put it in the oven and they looked through the whole, whole house. They tore it up, tore up the floorboards and anything they could do, you know, pierced into the mattress, whatever they could do to find the Bible. Last thing they did was went to the, the stove where she was cooking the bread. They looked inside and just some bread cooking over the ovens, over the coals. They said, ah, it must have been a, must have been a false statement. They took off and here now the house is a wreck. And the daughter, finally when they left, she turned around to see the Bible and it was gone. And she looked at her mom with a look of, what happened? And her mom just, you know, just kind of nodded. She then, they began to clean up the house, and finally dad came home, and he saw everything, everything in disarray. He didn't even ask. He could tell. He knew what happened. And so the time came for them to eat, and as they were getting ready to eat, the table was all set, the food was there, and, and uh, the dad grabbed the knife to begin to cut the bread, and this day the mother said, um, can I cut the bread tonight? That was normally what dad did. And she said, or he said, Okay. And she ever so carefully and gingerly cuts through the bread and pulls out a perfectly preserved Bible. And she tells the story. She said, I think it had to be an angel because I wasn't even thinking about doing it. She said it was as if my hands just took it, wrapped the Bible in the bread and put it in there without thinking and put it in the oven. And God spared their lives. You may have heard that Waldensy children, they would take the children and they would say, all right, Brother Charles, your children are going to memorize Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. And they would say, Phil, well, you've got a big family, so you're going to, they're going to memorize the next 10 books of the Bible, right? And, and they, would, they would go through the Waldensy families in a village and all of the children together collectively would memorize the entire Bible so that if the papacy sent their soldiers in, they could take away all their Bibles, and they could just bring the children together, and they could give them the Word of God again. We are told that the, the priests were often terrified to come into contact, con contact with Waldensian children because they knew the Word of God so well. Friends, same with the, same with the uh, Elbigenses, those, those uh, uh, or the Huguenots, rather. Their children were just faithful to the Word of God. Some of my favorite people in history. Friends, God is calling us to love his truth in the last days. And I want to close with one, one little message. Some of you have heard of Richard Wormbrand. He wrote a book called Tortured for Christ, right? He was tortured for years in a Romanian prison camp. And by the way, if you haven't read that book, The Seventh-day Ox, anybody, have you read The Seventh-day Ox? Okay, several of you. That is like, you know, like an amazing, amazing book. Uh, I could hardly sleep as I was reading that book, but it is powerful. Seventh Acts, three stories in there worth reading. This is not it. This is uh, uh, Richard Wormbrand's wife, Sabina, wrote a book called The Pastor's Wife. 
She too was taken into a concentration camp, and I want you to hear what she said. She said, after spending months in the labor camps, those of us who had faith realized for the first time how rich we were. The youngest Christians and the weakest had more resources to call on than the wealthiest old ladies and the most brilliant intellectuals. It was so sad to watch, but the upper class women were often the most pitiful in the, labor, in the prison labor camps. She went on to say, life was harder for them than for anyone. They'd lost the most in the material sense, and they had the fewest inner resources to fill the gap. A rubble of old games of bridge, hats, fancy clothes, hotels, luxurious dining, cinema, lost weekends and lovers rattled about in their heads like junk in the backseat of a car. Their nerves gave way first, as did their soft white hands. After long hours of grueling work, many of the women came to us religious prisoners and asked, begged even, to be told something of what we remembered from the Bible. The words we shared from God's Word gave hope, comfort, life. Of course, we had no Bible. We ourselves hungered more for it than bread. How I wished I learned more of the Bible by heart while still in freedom. But the passages we did know, we repeated daily and at night when we held vigils for prayer. Other Christians like me had deliberately committed long passages to memory, knowing that soon their turn would come for a rest. Soon they brought pre- so they brought precious riches to prison with them that could not be stolen. While others quarreled and fought, we lay on our mattresses and used the Bible for prayer and meditation and repeated its verses to ourselves through the long, dark nights. We learned what verses newcomers brought and taught them what we knew. In this way, an unwritten Bible circulated through all of Romania's prisons. This was a woman that loved the truth. This was a woman who recognized that trials may come, perilous times might come to her, and they did. And so she had had spent time with Jesus, stored up large, large passages of Scripture in her mind and in her heart, and she was able to use those to be a witness in her own, as it were, time of trial, her own time of trouble. And friends, God is calling us in these last days that do we have a love for the truth? Friends, we need to spend time in this book. Even if you do it from a selfish motive, if you will open your heart as you do it, Jesus can change your life. I want to be with every one of you. Just this morning, like I said, I I prayed for that man. I want that man to be in heaven that I saw who was trying to help me out on the street today. He wanted to help me. I want to see each one of you in heaven. And there's no need for any of us to be lost. Just now, we have our ushers. Our ushers are going to be coming forward, and they're going to be passing out a card. They're going to be passing out a card on my commitment to Jesus. God is calling us in these incredible times that we are in, actually very exciting times that we are in. You can pass them right out, and they're going to be passing them out for us. And so, Jesus is coming soon, and he's calling us to be ready. And he's not calling us to be ready out of like simple fear. He wants us to be face to face with him. He wants us when he comes in the clouds of heaven to have no fear. To have no fear of what is coming but saying, you know what? I see my Lord coming. Here he is. This is him. As Zechariah says, this is him. We have waited for him. I want to be ready when he comes back in the clouds of heaven. I want to be there saying, Jesus, you are my Savior. But I think about it. There was a time, as I shared, I didn't like the Bible. I wasn't interested in the Bible. I was actually, I first became a Christian with my friend Andy. We were going to the charismatic church. I wanted nothing to do with reading the Bible. My mom said to me this. She actually asked me at one point. She went to church every Sunday. She said, Chad, do you read the Bible? And I made one of the dumbest answers I've ever made in my life. I said, I don't need to. I don't need to. And this is what I said. I can't believe I said this. I said, because during the dark ages, many people couldn't even have the Bible and they could still be Christians, so I don't need to read the Bible. Now, do you realize why that was such a dumb statement? Because they were what? 
they were willing to die to have the Bible. And I had the Bible sitting on the shelf, and I wasn't even willing to crack the pages. I wanted to be a Christian that didn't want to look at God's Word. Oh, friends, I hope you're not like me. Probably not, because nobody would say something as foolish as I have. I, have. I have been the fool. I have, you know, Paul was the chief of sinners. I could say that for myself, but I was like the chief of fools, really, in my life, doing so many foolish things. But I can say, Jesus, somehow, some way, he still loved me, and he still loves you. And I want to challenge you. Jesus is telling us, spend time with me. Put down, the, put down the phone, put down the internet, put down the television, or whatever it is you're into. I, I could have it way off. Maybe you love you know, quilting so much you just can't find time for Jesus, right? I have no idea what it is, but it could be anything for anybody. And it doesn't matter what it is as long as it keeps you from Jesus. As long as it keeps you from Jesus. Now, if you have your card, my commitment to Jesus, it says, I want to yield my life to the Holy Spirit and allow God's word to lead me. I hope we can all put a check by that one. Does anybody need a pen or a pencil, by the way? Raise your hand. Do we have some of those? Yeah, okay, up here in the front. Anybody else? Raise your hand. There's some back here. Raise your hand if you need a pen or a pencil. So I want to yield my life to the Holy Spirit and allow God's word to lead me. Number two, I desire for the first time, if you've never accepted Jesus as your, as your Lord and Savior, I, I desire for the first time to accept Jesus as my personal Savior. If that is your desire, put a check right there by number two. Number three, I have wandered from the Lord and desire to recommit my life to him. Maybe you have allowed your life to be filled with the world. Whatever it is, whatever it is, you don't have to, confess what it is. This is between you and the Lord, but you want to say, you know what, I do want to recommit my life to him. Put a check right there by number three. Number four, maybe you would like to say, I would like to be baptized as Jesus was. You see, you saw our two friends baptized this morning. Maybe there's somebody else here who says, you know, I think it is the time. I put it off and today is the day. I want to make that decision. So if that's your desire, would you put a check there right by number four? Number five, by grace, I want to be one of the people that keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. And we can only do this by faith. We can't do this on our own. You say, I would like to be a part of that group. Put a check there by number five. And number six, maybe you say, I have questions and would like a personal visit. If you would like that, put a check there right by number six, and then you can, uh, you know, your name and your contact. And friends, make the decision. Make the decision that Jesus is calling you to make. When you are done, you can take your card and you can turn it upside down. And you can, you can this, the center aisle, you can pass them to this side. And uh, this side over here, you can pass them to the center. And over here, you can pass them over here. And we'll have the ushers coming just now and they're going to be picking up the cards. You can turn them upside down and pass them down the aisle. You can do that just now. Friends, as they are picking that up, I wanna, we're going to pray in just a moment, but I want to let you know we are beginning our, our seminar on Foundations of Prophecy, this class we're going to be starting tomorrow night. It's going to be a weekly class at 7 p.m., studying the Word of God, uh, digging deeper. I'll tell you what, many young people, and I, I don't say this to be insulting, I've just seen it to be true, many young people will go to our educational system and they will walk out never actually finding out what we believe. Seeing this, this is a common occurrence. I would challenge you, even if you think, my wife was one of those young people, she thought she knew it all until she actually went to a seminar and she's like, wow, man, this is so much more than I realized. And so I would challenge you that if you have never, and I know most, most families would never take a young person to a Bible prophecy seminar, um, and they will often never discover the beauty of what we have in our message. So I would challenge you, I would challenge you, uh, come out, take your young people, and uh, see some things that maybe you've never seen before. And um, we're told only those who fortify their minds with the truth of God's word are going to be able to stand through the last great conflict. So I would challenge you and be in the word daily. Don't miss a day with your Savior Jesus Christ. Spend time with him daily. Let's close with prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you so much for your word. For our Savior, who is the way, the truth, and the life. 
for the book you've given us that reveals him to us. Lord, I pray that once again we would become people of the book. Not just nice people who are, you know, good citizens of America or good citizens of the world, but Father, that we would actually be light bearers of your truth in these last days. That we would read this book so that we wouldn't help but be able to share the wonderful truths that we're learning of our Savior Jesus Christ. Lord, that we would yield our hearts day by day to you and that we wouldn't miss a day in your word because we don't want to lose our connection with you. Draw each one of us near to you, we pray in Jesus' name.